what is cooling? What's going on? If you couldn't tell over the past couple of days, I've been itching to watch Deadpool and Wolverine. It finally came out. Let's go, Disney. And it was worth the wait. It was really, really good. So without further ado today, let's get something that we can sink our claws into. Dane Brugler, who just released his top 20, top 50 big board, which I've also been waiting quite a bit of time for. Another thing, I do want to point this out. I am in a Hyundai, not a Honda. This ain't no Honda Odyssey, baby. <laughs> Enough with the Deadpool and Wolverine references. Let's get into this 2025 big board via Dane Brugler, top 50 updated. Also, I did just release my uh, big board on Sunday, so I'm curious to see how close we are. Probably way off. He's pretty dang good. He's listened to this guy right here. Travis Hunter is the number one. We do have this in common. Travis Hunter, number one. Hunter is the best draft eligible player in the country. 100% agree. And I don't think this will change. I agree with that. I think he's just, the what he brings as a corner and a receiver is truly generational. He is the champ Bailey. He's the... Deion Sanders, there's different, of course, but he is that guy, and what he's going to bring to the NFL, I think, is going to be a true difference maker. I would say you play cornerback full-time, you play receiver part-time, and whether or not the position pays more receiver, he's going to get paid. It just is. Like When you're a generational type of player that can have an impact that Travis Hunter is going to have, you're going to pay him as that top-end-of-the-market guy. Ultimately, who's ever seen at number one, I would go Travis Hunter. Unless you need a quarterback, then you try to trade down if you can. I know that could be a little tricky. Will Johnson's number two, self-explanatory. Will Johnson, he's a really good prospect. And even though he's been injured for a good chunk of this season, I think the skill set with his fluidity, his size, his run defense, just overall coverage prowess is going to be looked at really, really highly. Really solid athlete. I don't think he's an elite athlete, but he is a very solid athlete. And once again, at his size, a lot of NFL teams are going to put him in a a press zone scheme and just love what he brings. He can run press man too. Abdul Carter at number three. I love this, man. Let's go. Abdul Carter has been on a tear. He's been so good on that Penn State defensive line. Has a linebacker last season as well. I mean, it's going back to a true freshman season. He is just, he's one of those guys that I feel really, really good about. No matter what, he is going to be a difference maker on the football field. And that's what I want. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially when you're looking at these players in this draft, I want difference makers, and Abdul Carter is that guy. He's just going to be a difference maker. I feel like he's a top five pick in this draft class. And then we go on to Malik. Oh, Malachi Starks at number four. I would be, I'm a little lower on Malachi. Look, I still think he's a top 10 player, but I would rank Mason Graham above Malachi Starks. There are some questions for me at times with Malachi Starks. Sometimes I feel like he doesn't always show the crazy athleticism. And then there's other times where I'm like, whoa, he's like unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of weird with Malachi Starks. He'll let up a couple of big plays here and there. So maybe he can clean up some of those things in his technique. In general, though, he's very good. So these are nitpicking on things. I think he's a top-end prospect and certainly have no problem with him going inside the top 10. Tetaroa McMillan, Air McMillan, as I like to call him, or a lot of people call him Tet McMillan or whatever you want. <laughs> he's had so many good names with, for Tetaroa McMillan. He's had an unbelievable season. I think his hands are phenomenal. He's got enough agility to be able to kind of separate at the top of the stem. He's got tremendous size, obviously at six foot five, a unique athlete. Very, very, very good. And certainly if you need a number one receiver, I think he's going to be that guy. Now, I don't see him in the mold of like an elite receiver. He's certainly not like Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. type prospect for me, but he's very, very good. Ashton Genty at number six. absolutely, freaking lootly man. Genty is phenomenal. I'm glad he's up this high. He's one of those guys where it's at the running back position, but he is worth taking, in my opinion, in the top 10, especially if you have a game plan to use Ashton Genty in the receiving game, in the run game, in that co collegial approach. Uh, that, that's not a word. I don't think we're just making up words as usual here on the channel. That's how we do it. But Ashton Genty, the boulder out there at Boise State, if you're looking for a, a, just an all-purpose running back in a modern-day NFL where Lighter boxes are becoming a thing and running backs becoming more valuable. I think Genty is going to be really valuable in this draft class. And then you got Jalen Walker here at number seven. Oh, two Georgia Cats here. Where, where is Mason Graham? Unbelievable. Anyway, we'll hopefully see here soon. <laughs> but uh, Jalen Walker is really, really good. I mean, he's just, he's another disruptor, man. And, and when you can't help but notice number 11 when you're watching the Bulldogs defense. Like he is the guy that sticks out. Him and Malachi Starks to me stick out more than anybody on that defense. Number 11, you have to contain this guy wherever he's at, whether he's playing off the ball, whether he's playing on the line, 
especially in modern day NFL defenses, the way that they can utilize, like maybe like going back 10, 15 years, someone like Jalen Walker would be a little bit more harem square him. You'd be a little unfamiliar how to use him. But nowadays it seems like, you know, NFL teams are wanting guys like Jalen Walker, getting him in those roles where he's going to be able to pursue out of backfield and the running backs and stuff like that, chasing sideline to sideline, but also on third downs and whatnot, getting him off the ball or off on the line of scrimmage and rushing the passer. Like he is just going to be so valuable in that regard as a pass rusher, as a dual threat uh, playmaker on that back end and in in, for your defense. So I, I like that one. You know, I, I mean, that's ho- a little higher than what I have him at, but I certainly would say he's a top 15 player ish in this draft class. Really talented. Mikael Williams, this is a little bit too high for me. The tools are there. I have no question about it. The traits, the tools, the athleticism, it's all there for Mikael Williams. He just hasn't really put it together yet. I still like him, though. I really do think he's a top 15, top 20 player. And with projection, he is going to go in, the, for me, Rashawn Gary range. I, I'm 100% fine taking him in that in that sort of range. But number eight is a little high, over, especially over Mason Graham. I'm taking Mason Graham. I understand positional value, an edge rusher over a defensive interior player. But at the end of the day, I just want good defensive linemen. Or I just want good defensive players. I think Mason Graham is better. I think his block destruction, his relentless relentlessness, as he would put this here, He's just phenomenal, man. He just gets off blocks so consistently. He's going to affect the quarterback. While he may not be an elite athlete, he is going to be a disruptive menace on your defensive line. And a Quentin Williams, like if I can get some version of Quentin Williams, which I think Mason Graham can be, then I am 100% fine taking that top five. He is a top five player for me. I feel like he's in the blue chip category. And then on to number 10, Luther Burton the third, Missouri wide receiver. He's had an up and down year this season partially because of the quarterback play there. I'm surprised, actually, by Brady Cook. I thought it would be have a little bit better season this year. Nonetheless, they've really struggled getting any sort of consistency out there. Theo Weiss has been a solid target as well for Missouri, but I am definitely surprised Burton has been more involved this season. And I'm not super worried about it, especially when it comes to receivers, because you have to look at a lot more than that. Like the athleticism with Burton and the size, the yak ability, it's going to play in the next level. But I do compare him to like a DJ Moore in that sense where he's going to need a quarterback. And the most, you know, that's fine. Most receivers are going to need a quarterback to be a solid. But just, do I think he's like Justin Jefferson, Tyreek Hill, like a, a true number one elite top five receiver? No. But I do think he can be in that 10 to 20 range. That's a difference maker, can be your team's number one receiver. So still a really good prospect. I'm okay with this ranking. I think it's a little high, but I think it's fair. I do think it's fair. And he's a really good player. And receivers are obviously valued in the NFL. Will Campbell at number 11, really solid. Obviously, Will Campbell. It's going to come down to the sub 33 inch arms. How do you feel about that? But I think he is, his balance, his hands are really, really good. And that's going to make and a lot of NFL teams want to draft this guy. And it just comes down to, are you okay with that sub 33 inch arm threshold mark that a lot of teams obviously want 34 inch arms at the tackle position. Maybe he slides over to right tackle too for a team. He does have experience over there in high school days. So either which way, I think Will Campbell is the most solid tackle prospect in this class. I don't know if he is, I, personally, I don't think he's the highest upside. I like Josh Connolly a lot. I mean, you got Josh Simmons. We'll see how about the injury stuff. But yeah, I mean, Will Campbell, really solid player. If you're just looking for a plug and play guy, I think Will Campbell's your dude. So I'm good with 11. I think that makes a lot of sense too. James Pierce Jr., he is another one of these super disruptive guys. Yo, this is, I was just saying this the other day. Will McDonald, like, he reminds me a lot of Will McDonald as a Jets fan. So he doesn't have, Run defense-wise, I do worry about him, especially early on in his career as a run defender. He needs to get stronger, especially at the point of attack. But as a pass rusher, oh, man, he's going to be dangerous, man. If you're just using this guy as a situational DPR early on in his career, oh, he's going to be a problem. So I like that sort of comparison a lot. He is going to be dangerous as a pass rusher. And then we go on to Colston Loveland here, tight end, Michigan, the Wolverine. And, you know, we already talking about Wolverines, but... Another Wolverine here at Loveland. He is really, really good. And I'm glad he's ranked this high because as a pass catcher, he's so dangerous. His route running ability, his lateral and twitchiness as a tight end at his size is incredible. Dalton Kincaid in similar ways. I like that little comp there. He's going to be highly coveted in this draft class where maybe there's not a lot of true first round talents. I think Loveland is in that conversation. Der- Woo, Derek Harmon. I love it. Dude, I'm a Ducks fan. Derek Harmon has been a stud. Okay, he really has. Um, Jamari Caldwell is really good as a run defender on that defensive line. You got Jordan Birch, Uyungale. Like, they've got some studs on that defensive line. Derek Harmon sticks out like a sore thumb or like a good sore thumb. 
he is so disruptive as a pass rusher. And he's got traits too. Six foot five, three ten. He's got solid arm length. He's gonna be somebody that's highly coveted. So I like this top 15 grade from Dane Brugler. Let's whoa, Shamar Stewart. I look, I like Shamar Stewart as well. I think he's fringe first round. I think he's in that Darius Robinson role with his athleticism and size. Teams are going to look at that, especially when we get into the combine. I think he's going to be a hot riser. And especially if he does get a senior bowl sort of thing, that's going to be something to keep an eye out on as well. But there are not many players that move at his size the way he does. Sub, you know, 250 pound rushers kind of which way. But yeah, he's certainly been really, really good. I think he's really developed his hands more this season as well, getting off pass rushers or uh, offensive tackles more consistently as well. So somebody that's going to rise up or it's with a combine. I don't see it this high, though. This is a little too high for me for Shamar Stewart, but very good player. He's definitely in that Darius Robinson range, though, at the moment. Could go higher. Cam Robinson at 16. The first quarterback on Dane Brugler's board is Cam Ward, and he has certainly been an up and down. When it comes to decision-making, you worry about that with Cam Ward, but certainly he has the arm talent. He's got the imp- you know, the improvisation ability to be able to make those wow plays and certainly be able to extend plays. It just comes down to the decision-making, those uh uh-oh moments, Sam Darnold-esque type of coming out of college, the the hero ball moments that I worried about with Sam. I worry about that with a little bit with Cam Cam Moore, and that's why I think he's a guy that really may want to let him sit and develop for a season behind a veteran quarterback. Don't rush him out there. Let him get some time there with a good offensive mind to help him develop. Number 17, you got Nick Scordon. While he may not have the crazy wow traits, the explosiveness, He's got physicality. He's got that bullying, you know, rush you over type ability. And he also got has good lateral agility for a guy his size. Like he moves really well in space. And he's going to be really effective on like stunts and, you know, moving him around onto like the, you know, five technique and the B gap and stuff like that. Getting him in multitude facets, he's going to be really dangerous in that regard. You got Kelvin Banks here at number 18. And I think he's. He's put up solid tape this season. I still worry about him a little bit at the tackle position, right? I think his balance is still questionable, right? He gets over his toes one too often. His hands are inconsistent, but he certainly has the play strength. He has really good lateral agility too, and that's the one thing that really saves him. So when he's getting over his toes, he's able to adjust because of that lateral agility, which helps him out. So if he can just kind of hone in on his punch, his hand technique, and not getting so far over his toes and trusting himself. Man, I, I, he could be a really good tackle in the NFL. I do like him a lot right now as a guard. That could be a long-term tackle. But I kind of see him as someone like a, maybe like a Tyler Smith. I think that's kind of a good little comparison. Maybe a little bit more refined Tyler Smith. Tyler, whoa, let's go. I love Tyler Williams, man. He's underrated in this class, in my opinion. Yeah, he is not going to be those most eye-popping sort of elite tools guy, but he has a really good get-off. And he's, Got that twitchiness that you look for from a big man. And that's an underrated skill set by a big man, especially a guy that is so good at run defense. He just can shoot gaps. He can two-gap really, really well. He's got great block destruction as well. So just somebody that I feel like has got a very, very high floor and certainly in a class where maybe, you know, you don't have always that. I think Tyler Williams is one of those dudes I would take no problem about it. He's a good football player. Walter Nolan Oh, wow. Okay. Back-to-back defensive tackles. And it's a really good defensive tackle class. Nolan is a lot more volatile as, as Dane Brugler is saying here, but he has a lot higher end traits, right? I mean, his twitchiness, his athleticism, he's shown a lot better block destruction. Even this past week versus Georgia had a really, really nice rep against Jared Wilson, kind of disrupting the chopping the hands, getting around him, who's an athletic guy in his own right. But Walter Nolan certainly has the ability to be a top end defense tackle with the right development in the NFL. Javon Revel just comes down to the injury. I think if it weren't for the injury, 4-3 speed is what he's projecting at. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me either. But similar to Josh Simmons, this guy would be a lot higher on boards if it weren't for the injury, which just really sucks, man. It really does. You don't find guys that are six foot two, 200 plus pounds, and have that freaky athleticism that Siobhan Revel has. He's so good at the catch point as well. Jalen Milrow, a rocket field version of Jalen Hurts. I like that little comp as well. 4-3 speed is what he's saying as well, which wouldn't surprise me. I mean, he definitely has 4-4 speed. I think he's a better runner, too, than Anthony Richardson. He's a lot more twitchy as a runner, so it makes him more dangerous. He's more agile. He has a more of that Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts. You know, in space, he's more dangerous, right? Whereas Anthony Richardson's dangerous. Like, he's got crazy athleticism. Don't get me wrong. And he, I think he's got a better arm, like a better powerful arm, even though Melrose has got a solid arm as well. Like, he can definitely get that ball down the field. He's got no issues in that regard. 
But in terms of that just freakish ability, I think Richardson has a bit more there. But I think he's a more dangerous playmaker. And certainly in that Lamar, uh, Jalen Hurts role, right? And I like him a lot. I really do. I like Milro a ton. And he's kind of, you know, he's right there with my number one quarterback. And they got Shador Sanders here. There's a lot of baggage, as he was saying. Pack- Wait, no. I know he's a lot of package of skills, pardon me. But people are going to say baggage with the whole Shador thing. I'm not worried about it at all, personally. We'll see how it comes down to if he forces to go here and there. But he says he reminds him of Jordan Love. That's an interesting little comp there. But high-end physical tra- without the high-end physical traits, which is true. I mean, Lord, Love doesn't have crazy high-end physical traits. But anyway, I think Sanders is the most skilled passer in this draft class at least at the moment, right? The accuracy is the best. I think his pocket presence needs a little bit of work, but certainly has the makings of a really, really good passer in the NFL. JT Tui Moalau may not have one exceptional trait. I agree with that. He's just maybe above average and across the board, but he knows how to play football. And that's going to get coveted a lot by NFL scouts, whether it's dropping back in coverage, rushing the passer, and his skill says pass rushing tools. He just doesn't have, you know, he's a really loose athlete as well. He's not an explosive athlete, but he's a loose athlete. And he's going to get after the quarterback. So he may not be a 10-plus sack guy, but he's going to be disruptive. He's going to be great in in coverage as well. Kenneth Grant at number 25. There simply aren't many guys at 340 pounds that move the way he does and have the balance to play the way he does to move gaps. I agree with that. He is just, I think he's got to get show more consistency getting off blockers, especially in the run game for me. I know he's improved in that department this year. So going into the season, that was definitely something I wanted to see to move up my big board. And he certainly has for that reason. But he still has some work to go in that regard. I also don't think he is maybe as athletic as what people are saying, just on film watching him. I don't don't think he's maybe Mozzie Smith level of slow off the line or anything like that. I definitely think he's faster off the line. But I just want to see some more consistency in that regard for Kenneth Grant. But I think 25 is a very fair ranking for him. On to the infamous Tyler Warren. Offense alignment, receiver, tight end, running back, quarterback. Who knows, right? He can play center if you want him to. But he is so much fun to watch there at Penn State. I actually think the gap between him and Colson Loveland is closer than this because Dane has his Loveland at, what, 13? So I, I would actually put those two guys closer together. Warren is really just, I think he's got tremendous size. He's got tremendous ability to catch the ball. I mean, there are some there are some occasions where he just has overall drops and have to work on that. He's not the strongest blocker, as Dane would say here, but he certainly is a guy that's going to be in a creative offense. He's going to be a difference maker for you. Love this tight end class, man. It is so good. And you got guys on day two that are going to be studs: John Michael Galenborg, Harold Fanning Jr., Jake Brennan's stool, Terrence Ferguson, Luke Lachey. You name it, like Gunnar Helm, that are guys that normally would probably go on day two as well. Speaking of another uh, Longhorn, Cameron Williams, big offensive tackle, similar to Marius Mims last year. He's going to get compared to him a lot. I actually think he's a better mover than than, uh, Marius Mims is. And I also think he's better with his hands than Mims is. I think his overall hand punch is a little bit more contact-wise, especially at this point. I think he's really good. Now, he's not always perfect with his hands. He's really inconsistent, right? He needs to work on his hand technique in terms of his overall placement. But like his punch has a lot to go there. And I think that there's a lot of room for him to really improve that even more and get it better. And with that size and the power profile that he has, I just think that a lot of teams are going to look at this guy, especially in the back end of the first round. If you need a tackle, take Cameron Williams. It makes 100% sense to take a guy like Cameron Williams with his six foot five, 335 pound frame with his movement skills. Alec Ayu Manor, woo! This is higher than I've seen Alec Ayu Manor really in, in since the preseason. And that's fine. Look, I like IU Manor is a really good receiver. And it's not hard to understand when you watch Stanford games that they struggle on offense, right? And I like IU Manor is getting, you know, he's one of those guys that's going to need a quarterback that's willing to throw to him, right? And is willing to go up and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be able to put the money on these back shoulder throws or high point it, right? So he's going to need like a Russell Wilson type. Like that would be the dream fit for me is somebody like a Russell Wilson, like a Kyler Murray in that sort of mold that is willing to give those go balls and be really accurate with those. And that's really where Alec IU Manor is going to thrive at the next level with his vertical speed. It's really a big thing. He's not the most deceptive guy, and that's my only big question on him. Is he going to be the most integral route runner and create tons of separation? No, but he's going to win on that vertical plane, especially with his size and speed. Then you got Josh Simmons, which, yeah, he would be much higher, I would imagine, if, you know, for the first month of the season, he looked good throughout the entirety of the game. 
and that knee injury in the Oregon game really sucks. It really does, because I think he could have been a top 15 pick in this draft class. He's got really good movement skills. He's got good, he, he improved his hand placement too this year, but he's got a good punch to his game and really can knock and drive back defenders in the run game, which is really impressive. Him working with Donovan Jackson this season was really, really fun to see. So it's too bad we can't see any more of that. Anyway, Josh Simmons at the end of the first round, oh, 100%. He should be ready to go too by training camp range. It's going to be close, I would imagine, but he should be in that ballpark. If nothing else, he's a guy where, you know, if you're taking him at the back end of the first round, hopefully you can find a sign a free agent because you're a winning team that can start early on in the season and Josh Simmons get him fully healthy and you don't even need to start him right away. That would be ideal. Garrett Nussmeyer at 30. Through six weeks of the season, I was ready to put Nussmeyer at QB1 label. Interesting. He was doing QB1 things. However, the Texas A&M game, been a problem. The uh, Alabama game this past week. He, his decision-making, it's just been his biggest Achilles heel. And even in the first six of the, uh, games of the season, he was having some of those issues. He got away with some turnovers, especially early in the season. So it was there on film with Nussmeier. But what I love about Nussmeier, and I think what a lot of people like about him, is that he is willing to throw people open, right? He's not going to just, like, you have to be open, like, He'll throw people open. He'll get the ball on time. That's why I think he's saying he'll do what quarterback things, right? He does that to his game. He's not going to be like, oh, I, everything has to be perfect for me to work. No, he'll make plays happen. Even though he's not the most athletic, even though he doesn't have the crazy arm talent, he's got that mentality that you look for in the NFL. And I really do like him as a pocket passer, like a Kirk Cousins-esque type of quarterback and I'm fine like if you wanted to take him at the back end of the first like I wouldn't take him top 10 at the moment and ultimately he probably does need to come back for another year like that would be ideal for Garrett Nussmeyer because then he could be a first round lock next season however we'll see how it goes with Nussmeyer and then the quarterback needy teams are going to be trying to reach for quarterbacks so that is what it is I wouldn't hate the reach on Garrett Nussmeyer I would just have to be very cautious with that approach and I'd also say you want to try to sign a veteran in that case scenario Landon Jackson, woo! Yeah, he's not the most super fluid guy, but he's going to be more, more your powerful, your Preston Smith, uh, you know, a la Preston Smith sort of mold in that cloth where he's just going to kind of come through you, win with his arm length, win with his size. That's, for, that's Landon Jackson. This is a little high for me on Landon Jackson. He's just too inconsistent with his game, but he certainly has the talent and the size. NFL teams are going to look for that. At 6'5", 275 pounds, he is going to look the part as an NFL edge rusher and a guy that could also move inside and, and work in you know in certain molds on third down packages. Jonas Salvanaia has been exceptional at right tackle this season for Arizona. I like this ranking here, top 32. He's a first round type of prospect for me. And I do think he could play tackle, man. He really could. He's shown enough this season where I'm like, you know what? Maybe you could go ahead and try him at the right tackle position in the NFL. See if it works out. If it doesn't, then it doesn't. But in general, I think that he is going to be a really good offensive lineman for whoever gets him. If you're the Detroit Lions and, you know, you put him inside a guard, like, oh, that'd be a phenomenal idea. Josh Connolly Jr., you know my guy here in this class. I think, you know, for me, he's a top 15 prospect in this class, and I really love his upside, man. And not just the upside. He's played so good for the Ducks this season. And once again, as a guy who's been watching the Ducks every single game, he has just been an anchor. And Jeannie Cornelius has been really good. I mean, Marcus Harper, that offensive line in general has been really clicking and one of the reasons why they're undefeated this season. And the defensive line has been really good too. The secondary has been nice. But Connerly is certainly got is a guy, I think he's got the best hand placement in this draft class. He's got unbelievable lateral and movement skills in this draft class. But I would say in general, like inconsistency and size are probably the two biggest question marks on why he's not higher unanimously on boards. For me though, I think he's, he's really a really good prospect. Dion Walker, like Kenneth Grant, Walker has a unique ability for his gargantuan size. Listed 345 pounds, six foot six, former basketball player. He's light, nimble on his feet for a guy that is that size. And he is so, and I say this over and over again, but he is so challenging to block one-on-one -on -one as a guard, as a center. It just, he is very, very going to be much a problem, especially if he can put his tools together. He could be the next sexy Dexy in the NFL. Like He has that upside. And that's why he's higher on my board because of that upside. Now, he does need to get better with his leverage in the run game, especially. It's been a problem for him. But he just has so much upside where you can coach him up, get him into that mold, man. I think he could be an elite superstar. Emeka Abuka here at 35. He's Mr. Just, yeah, I like this. Kind of like his teammate, JT2MO Lau. He has 
there's nothing extraordinary, but he just is a good freaking football player. And especially in this class, I'm taking good freaking football players. Any class, I'm taking good freaking football players. There's not a whole ton of weaknesses to his game. And then another receiver that I'm a huge fan of, Evan Stewart. And both of these guys outside the top 32, which for me are both, oh, oh I can't wait to talk about this next guy too. These are both of these guys, like all three of these guys are really dudes that I think are, are being underrated in, in many senses. But Evan Stewart, his talent is just undeniable. It really is. And it's unfortunate that Michigan touchdown from the past couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago was called back. That was would have been maybe catch of the year. It was definitely up there with catch of the year. This guy, there's no doubt in my mind, the ball skills, the route running, the athleticism, maybe he doesn't have the crazy size. And that's going to be something, you know, they just have to work on. But he is just, to me, he's a Garrett Wilson. He's Devontae Smith if nothing else, in that role. My big ask is just, yo, Ducks, let's start using Evan Stewart more. They're going to have to lean on him with, yeah, with Tess Johnson's injury, more, more or less. Mike Green, let's go. He's higher on Mike Green. And I thought I was super high on Mike Green, having a top 50 grade on him. 37, Mike Green is a superstar in the making that is so underrated. He is exceptional with his athleticism. He's got pass rush moves as well. He's not just a speed rusher. I mean, he can work that speed. There's no doubt about it, but he can work some spins. He can work some chops some counters, some swipes and stuff like that. And he's also tenacious in the run, man. And it's not just against lower level competition. It's against Ohio State. It's against Virginia Tech. He's holding his own there. You know what I'm saying? Like he really is. Him and Cassius Hal, I feel like it's also an underrated guy. He's a real deep underrated guy, but he can hold his own as well for his size. Mike Green, really love this one. Can't wait to say and see what happens with him in the combine. Some reading this are saying, who? But uh, Scooby-Doo? No, man, he's a stud. I can't, like I said, I need to do a breakdown on him. He's only a redshirt sophomore, too. I didn't even realize that. Maxwell Harrison at 38, really good cornerback that has great athleticism, great movement skills. He's sure going to be another cover corner from Kentucky, man. They're producing some guys with Andrew Phillips this past season under Drew Phillips. Any which way, Maxwell Harrison just been injured for a good chunk of this season going back to week four, I believe it was, when he got injured versus the Ohio game, was it? So, yeah, he's been out for a minute. Hopefully he comes back here soon, nonetheless, as I'm getting hit with rocks here. I don't know what that was. Woo, it scared the crap out of me. Oh, man, I see a reaction. Yeah, this is a reaction to me and uh, rocks coming down on my car right now. That literally was like a rock. I don't know where the heck that came from. Caleb Johnson here, 39, is a really good running. Wow, Caleb Johnson over Amari and Hampton and Quinshawn Judkins, an interesting one. He's been exceptional this year, so I don't hate it. I really don't. Johnson's been phenomenal. Find that good offensive line by Iowa, and run blocking-wise. And they struggle pass protection, but they open lanes in the run game. Overall, though, Johnson's just got a blend of size, athleticism, overall power and contact balance that you look for at the next level and it's going to play and yeah he is a north south runner he just hits that lane and he goes so he's got that burst he doesn't have elite athleticism in my opinion but he definitely has really really nice solid he's a good athlete here's amari hampton he's another guy where it's just there's not many kings to his game so i personally have a hampton over over johnson but i understand why you would you know put johnson over hampton it's a close call it's not like it's it's a far gap but hampton to me just, I really love his game, and I think he's a borderline first-round pick, especially for the running back position and the way that it's being valued now in the NFL. Like, you need more running backs, in my opinion. Amari Hampton is certainly that guy that has the three-down skill set as well that you're gonna teams are going to look for. Nick Eman Wari. Eman Wari. But, dude, he has been electric this season in that back end for South Carolina, which is helped by that front four, which they've got on South Carolina. It was one of the best in the, the, NFL, or the uh, college football whole categorization like Kyle Kennard, Dalen, Dalen Edwards, they are going to have, so they've got some studs on that defensive line. TJ Sanders, um, Tonka Hemingsway, like they've got studs on that defensive line. And they've also got studs in the secondary. Nicky Manwari is certainly that dude, man, with his size and his athleticism too. Now he's not the most twitchy guy, okay, but he moves well for a guy six foot three, 225 pounds. Some teams are going to want to convert him to the linebacker spot. I don't know. It's going to be really interesting. Like, he does have enough athleticism, I feel like, to play two high shells. He's going to be a mismatch nightmare. And if you think of, like, an Antonio Johnson, I think his tape is better than Antonio Johnson's coming out. And he's a more sure tackler as well. He's better covered, man, than that as well. But Nick Amanwari, keep an eye on him. He's going to be schematically, he's going to be one of those guys that it just depends on the team and what you're looking for. You're going to need him in, like, a, you know, a la Kyle Hamilton role. 
Wyatt Millam, interior offensive lineman, will tackle, plays left tackle, West Virginia, and they produce another good offensive lineman this year. They've been producing them. Wyatt Millam is a stud, man. He's played so good. He's so strong at the point of attack, moving dudes off the ball as well in the run game. He's one of the better run blockers in this class, at least in my opinion. And yeah, he's a tried, true guy. I think he's a fifth year, and it shows, man. He is just so, he's come so far with his hands. His lateral agility isn't elite. He's not the twitchiest guy, but he holds his own, man, especially at that left tackle position. That's why I think you put him inside the guard, too. He's going to mitigate some of those issues. And with that power profile and his strength, he's going to be great on the interior. He's just a really high floor player. Jack Sawyer at 43. I'm cool with this. Sawyer's been really, really solid. Again, I don't think he has the lead upside, but he's going to be a good football player. Think of like a Sam Hubbard. If nothing else, I think that's what you're getting with Jack Sawyer. Very strong at the point of attack. Good run defender. Has some pass rush upside as well with that power. And then Tyler Booker at 44. That's that's fair. I think Tyler Booker, you know, he's been a lot more consistent this year. He's been so much better, actually, in terms of his film. Because last year, even, you know, watching him, I only gave him a second round grade in the offseason. I was a little hesitant on that. I, I, under, I gave him the benefit of the doubt because of the size and the power profile. Like, it's rare to have the movement skills that he has and to have the size that he has. He looks so much better in terms of put together film this season. And he's been a sure protector for Jalen Milrow and a run blocking machine as well for Milrow in that offense. And then on to one of the most explosive playmakers in this entire draft class, Bond. Isaiah Bond. I love the celebration too. This guy is one of the best acceleration, twitchy, deep speed, you know, vertical threat guys. Think of your Jalen Waddles, your Jamison Williams. You know, I think he's a little more twitchier than that. And he's got good hands too. That's the thing with Isaiah Bond. He's not just speed guy. He's got hands, man. He can make those, you know, some tough catches. You really can. And he's underrated in that regard. Like, he makes tougher catches than you would expect. Really like Bond. It just comes down to the inconsistency with Bond and his tape. You know, they don't get him the ball a ton as much as I think the NFL will get this guy the ball and make sure that he's a vocal point in their offenses. So I'm, I'm not worried about with Bond. But it is unfortunate. A lot of this wide receiver class in general, it's like you're kind of making a little bit of a projection with some of the inconsistency. But the talent is there. It still is there. Ariante Ursary tackle Minnesota. I like this ranking. This is a little bit more where I'm at. I gave him more of a second, third round grade. I know a lot of people are higher on Ariante Ursary. I need to dig through this year's film to take a look. But going into the from this offseason, I felt like the balance consistency wasn't always there. Something I worry about with him against quicker, twitchier guys at the next level, especially when I was watching him against John Prius, I believe it was, from Will & Mary. So he kind of concerned me there with watching that film. There were a couple other ones where I'm like, you know, worry about that a little bit. I'll have to take a look at this year's tape here very, very soon on Ariante Ursary. But I do feel like this is a little bit more fair for where I'm at personally with Ariante Ursary. He does have the physical traits, though, with six foot six, 337 pounds. He is the most prototypical left tackle. He's got long arms, too, that teams are going to covet. Gray Zabel, dude, North Dakota State, they do it again. Every single time, it seems like they've got some sort of offense alignment that's coming up in the, in the prowess. My scouting report for him was just like, this guy's got good movement skills. He's dangerous on the move as a run blocker. He's got great, you know, snatch trap technique that you're seeing, you know, a Troy Fatanu in this class. You're seeing a guy like Marcus Bow have that. A lot of these guys now are trying to really hone in on that. And Gray Zabel is really good at that, too. He needs to work on his hand placement. I think his leverage is a little bit bad at times, too. He's a little upright, a little narrow with his stance. And I do think that it could hurt him down a little bit, even though he's, he's a strong guy. But it is smaller competition, so you wonder about that. The senior bowl level, that's going to be something we'll have to see. But he is strong on the North Dakota State tape, and I do like him a lot, man. And I've been hearing some rumors you know, about him going higher and higher, and I like him. I do. I really like him. And he's certainly going to be in a day two conversation, especially with a good senior bowl. Kyle Kennard, let's go. I'm glad he's up on this list. South Carolina edge rusher. He's had a dominant season, man. He's another, you cannot ignore. I mean, you got Dylan Stewart out there. You got some studs like I talked about earlier on that defense line, TJ Sanders, Tonka Amingsway, et cetera. Kyle Kennard has been maybe the best on that defense line in general this season. He is just, he's got that size that is not elite, but it's solid. Okay, he's got long enough arms. He also has enough explosiveness off the edge where it's like he'll hit you and he can get around the corner. He's not the most bendy guy, but he knows how to, you know, straighten out his feet, try to, you know, flatten his footwork. That's more of the word I'm looking for, but flatten and get around the get around the arc. Really like Kyle Kennard, and he's also been really good with like chopping and using his hands this season. Uh, so I think day two, it makes a lot of sense for a guy getting a really nice pass rusher there. Mason Taylor, I'm glad he made the list. Mason Taylor is 
Mr. Reliable there at LSU. Now, I think consistency with his hands, a little bit of a you know thing there, but in general, this guy has been one of the most solid tried after tight ends. And I, I feel like in this great tight end class, we'll see where he ends up going. He could be the third tight end. And you got the bloodlines, of course, with his, his dad, Jason Taylor. He just does everything that you want a tight end to do. He's a good inline blocker. He's, you know, Mr. Reliable as a receiver. And he's got enough route running capability as well. Deceptiveness. He's not an elite athlete, but he's a very, very solid one. And then we're finishing off here with a banger. Jihad Campbell linebacker slash edge rusher at Alabama, however you want to put him. He's got long arms for a guy six foot three, 245 pounds. Teams can get creative with this guy. This is another one of those dudes where it's, he's actually, if he wanted to come back for a season, maybe put on 10 pounds of muscle mass, be an Abdul Carter. He could literally rise to a top 10 pick next season if he wanted to. But even right now, he's, oh, 100%. I think he's a top 50 pick. I had a mock to the Jets as a Jets fan. I really like Jihad Campbell. He'd be such a nice addition to that team. He could be an off the ball. He could be a guy like I talk about that you could use in a 3-4 or even 4-3, you know, on rush downs, get him, you know, going after the passer, Micah Parsons mold. He really has that potential. And I mean, the athleticism with him is truly elite stuff. He's probably a 4-4 guy and certainly has the traits you look for. So if he can continue to work on his coverage, his zone IQ, I think that's going to be the big thing there. If he's going to be a true off the ball linebacker, nonetheless really and obviously if he's going to be a full-time pass rusher he's got to get off blocks more consistently and not just win with speed well that's going to do it here for dane brugler's top 50 big board it was fire really enjoyed it let me know what you think agree or disagree on it and i hope you guys have a cool day